Well, we're nailing the apex. We have another race week upon us. Tim Haraney, uh, we, we, I want to talk Chinese Grand Prix with you, our very first one since 2019. But first, let's talk about the calendar change for 2025. Why, Tim, is this a huge deal? Well, Adam, I mean, it just means we get uh, 24 races again on a massive calendar that uh, sees everybody uh, go around the world in, in the span of uh, March to December. So, I mean, it's a... Uh, I mean, it's big in terms of just how early they put it out, because usually we're we're waiting until August, September uh, for them to finalize something. But it just shows, I mean, obviously the health of of the sport. But uh, at the same time, I mean, I think also that the the tracks have signed such long term agreements that F1 pretty much knows where it's heading, when it's heading there. And I'm I, I'm glad we are starting things off with Australia because why why is that i I mean for me it's just like a classic i mean i just remember as a kid waking up at like one in the morning watching this with my dad and it's always been like that for me until obviously the past quite you know past few seasons so right i i really enjoy uh having australia kick everything off as for the testing i'll be interested to see what they do i mean I have a feeling they'll probably end up going be going back to Bahrain for preseason testing, mm-hmm. but I mean, let's just wait and see because yeah, you know, I remember back in the day again, like the Circuit of Catalonia, like the track in Barcelona. You know, they used to have two weeks of testing there. You know, it was like right. I believe it was, if I remember correctly, it's like three or four days each week, and and whatever. I was there in 2017 for uh, covering um, testing. Uh, for the two weeks and whatever it was awesome it was so much fun the access that we had gotten was great and as a fan i mean if you ever get the chance you should try and get to to preseason testing uh simply because the rules are a little more lax and you can do a little more stuff so it's interesting that you you bring up testing i, I was looking at the f1 calendar and by the way for anybody that doesn't know the the you know the a lot of the changes start in the first five races so you got australia you've got china you've got japan bahrain Saudi Arabia, and then Miami. And Miami will be early. It'll be in uh, early May next year. But, you know, one of the things that we talked about this year after Bahrain is that you don't get a sense of what the cars really are until after Australia, right? It was Bahrain, Jeddah, which is a super tight street circuit, and then Australia, which is, yes, a street circuit, but also a little bit more of a racetrack, right? A, a traditional racetrack with uh, open corners and and uh, and that sort of thing. And I, I wonder, Tim, if, you know, if testing in Bahrain kind of throws everybody off too, because that, that, the thing about it, and, and I don't think everybody knows this, is that, you know, the, the, the pavement there is really hard on tires. Is that a benefit or, or not? Uh, I don't think so because of the, just how difficult the surface is, right? Like it's not, it's not like regular tarmac. If you ever get a chance to, to go and you get close to the track or, uh, as close as you can get to the surface. I mean, it, you can see that it's like super abrasive. And so there's not many tracks in the calendar that are that abrasive. And it is something that we talked about on this podcast during the Bahrain Grand Prix when uh, I got to go and cover that. And just seeing the surface up close and personal, I was kind of just like, oh my God, I can't believe that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's built like this. Mm-hmm. And so I think you don't get a really good gauge on where everybody kind of is. You don't get a good gauge on how teams and cars, like what level of degradation their cars are able to withstand Mm -hmm. um, while running the Pirelli tire. But I think also like Adam, I, I, I like the fact that we're, we're kind of moving away from that for the first race of the season, because we may start to get a, a bit better better understanding of what everybody's got like once we get through let's say if preseason testings in Spain which is you know a natural ro- road course it the surface there is is quite you know normal we should say mm-hmm. um but we get a better understanding of where everybody is teams get a better understanding of like what their cars can actually do um but again i mean with this current regulation we sometimes kind of get into the the seasons now for the past few years, and we don't really know what everybody has until we get to like race, you know, three, four, or five. 
I mean, I think we have a pretty good understanding now of where everyone is after Japan, because mm -hmm. I think Japan's like a great barometer to to know where everybody actually is. And I think moving forward, Adam, it's all going to be about upgrades. Who's bringing what now from here on out? We kind of understand what, what the pecking order is. Um, but the more I kind of look at this calendar, the more I have a just a concern over like people's health, well-being. I mean, we have to remember that, you know, these teams, the crew, like it's a lot of travel. Mm -hmm. Like that's a lot. That's a long time to be away from home. It's a long time to be away from, you know, your family and things of that nature. And I think teams are getting a little bit better of having crews that can like rotate, rotate out, but, mm -hmm. but not everybody can do that with inside the F1 team. There are a lot of team personnel who, uh, you know, have to go to almost all of these events. And so that's quite difficult. I mean, for the drivers, it's a challenge, but it, it's not as big as like everybody else, right? I mean, the drivers have a, you know, obviously being the athlete, you have a little bit, you have, they have things a little bit easier uh, in that respect. And the drivers do understand that. And they, they talk about that pretty openly. The fact mm -hmm. that just how difficult this is on, on the team and the crew and so that that would be my only concern. It's just the calendar just getting too big, Adam. It's just I think twenty four is too many. I, yeah, I, I do. I don't know how you feel about it, but I think well, twenty four is too many. But I am pro as many races as we can fit into a year. Uh, but I understand right. the the human cost there, and and it is it's exhausting. And I'm looking at some of these travel schedules, right? Uh, so Saudi Arabia is the fifth race on the schedule next year, April eighteenth to twentieth. So next year, this time, this is what we're going to be talking about. But then they move directly to the United States for the Miami Grand Prix two weeks later. And then two weeks after that, you create you start a three race leg uh, in in Europe and then you're back to Canada for Montreal and then you're over to Austria. Um, and again, there are two week breaks in between these travel periods. But you got to remember, like, how long it takes you when you're jet lagged to get on the schedule of wherever you're supposed to be. And one place yeah. I was actually thinking, like, if they were going to change the schedule up uh was uh belgium i thought mm. can you find a spot not in the summer in the rainy season because mm. it's everybody's favorite course it's mm -hmm. it's such a fun drive and when it gets rained out it is such a bummer right and and yeah. you know that you can't help the weather in, in belgium the weather is what the weather is it does rain there can you not put that early spring or late fall or somewhere where like imola is going to be um, you know, another, another race that got rained out last year, Imola is going to be May 16th through 18th. You know, why can't, and I'm, I'm sure there's logistical reasons why, but I just kind of wonder if you're going to do a couple European legs, why not put Belgium at the beginning, um, because of just the realities of the weather there. Yeah. And it's trying to like get, it's, tr it's trying to make sure that the calendar, well, at least they're trying to get to that where it mm -hmm. makes sense of how you travel. Right? Cause you know, if you go back to if you go back to last year, you know, you were going from like Baku all the way over to like Miami in the span of a week. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, hold on a second. How does that make any sense? Right? Yeah. Like that's, that's really taxing on your, uh, that's really taxing on your personnel. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think. And then also the triple headers, right, Adam? I mean, like the triple headers, like some of those like weren't easy. I'm trying to remember what last year's was. It was like Vegas, Qatar, then was it Abu Dhabi? I think it yeah, was. Yeah, right which that. is a crazy amount of travel. Like that's a huge amount, dude. Like I did, um, I did Texas, Mexico, and then I was going to go to Brazil. And I was like, ah, oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe I won't go to Brazil because I've got to spend two weeks in Vegas. So my calendar would have looked like, my calendar would have looked like Texas, Mexico, if I had have done Brazil, Brazil straight to Vegas, mm -hmm. Vegas for two weeks back to Canada. And for some folks, it was like Texas, Mexico, Brazil, UK, Vegas, Ab uh, Qatar, that's Abu a lot. Dhabi. That's if that's I'm pretty sure it was Qatar, Abu Dhabi. That's how they finished last year. I, mine's of course and you know yeah it, it was Qatar Abu Dhabi but 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 you do feel like yeah it, the last few years it's just wiped there's no tradition anymore it's completely wiped it, the memory memory it, it's uh the, the thing is, is that that's a ton of travel that's that's mm -hmm. really hard that's very difficult to to kind of push through and get through and I remember I got really sick at the end of that lag so did a lot of other people who were in who were in F1 um 
I think like, oh man, there's, there's so many of us who ended up getting the, getting the flu that, that, uh, after, after Vegas, like it was, it was brutal. Let me pull up the, let me pull up the calendar to make sure I got, uh, the order in which the calendar went. Sorry, everyone. It was, uh, it went, it went Vegas, then straight into Abu Dhabi. I don't know what the hell I was thinking with Qatar. And you know what? Went, the rest of us don't either. We're really mad it went at you. Qatar. We're so upset. We're so upset. How, <laughs> how did you not have that <laughs> yeah. offhand? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Uh, It's because it went Qatar, uh, Texas. That's what it was. Mexico, Brazil, Vegas, Abu Dhabi. Like, that's a stretch, man. That's a tough stretch. Yeah. Yeah. That was last year. And so the same sort of similar type of stuff going on for this year and then next year as well. And so... Yeah, I don't know, Adam. It's uh that that's that is quite a bit. And then I don't know if you have like a bit of fan fatigue, right? Like it's Yep. And especially if it's like the racing, like if there isn't anything on the line, like let's say the championship is over with whatever, six races to go or seven races to go or eight races to go, right? Adam, like it's just it, how do you how do you kind of keep the fan engaged still? And mm-hmm. then you kind of get that fatigue of like three races back to back where it's like, well, the championships have already been sewn up. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting calendar. I think they're at their max uh, with what they can bring. And I, I think we're going to see rotating races here in the next few years yeah, where, probably. you know, yeah. I mean, I, I think um, formula for success, which is Eddie Jordan and David Coulthard's podcast was talking about what it would take to bring a, a, a race back to South Africa. And, you know, how one of the organizers there, the guys who, who does Formula E, was really hooked in with Nelson Mandela and, and, and that sort of thing. The reality of the situation is right now it's just not sustainable in South Africa specifically. And he said, I don't want to bring it back for three years. I want to bring it back for every year. Mm-hmm. And I just don't know, Tim, if that's going to be possible for a lot of these races. And, it, it, and you know, they talked about this a little bit with um, Spob potentially leaving the calendar and Monaco potentially leaving the calendar. And I think obviously those are two classic tracks that you never want to see. F1 fans never want to see a season without them. Although Monaco has its detractors just because you can't do anything in Monaco anymore. Um, yeah. But, you know, maybe there is some, some, uh, some intelligence in, you know, places like South Africa where maybe the investment levels aren't the same as they would be in the United States, of course. Mm-hmm. And okay, we, we need you to do a race once every three or four years. Can mm-hmm. you do that? Mm-hmm. And having rotational, mm-hmm. okay, we've got this hemisphere rotates these races in, this ro- hemisphere rotates these races in, mm-hmm. see a few more locales, let F1, you know, and, and that only has got to be two or three races on the calendar that switch every year, mm-hmm. but it could make for just a little bit more of a global outreach. Cause right now things, you know, Africa specifically has no race mm-hmm. and you need a world yeah. championship, right? No, you're right. So. And I think that's smart. I mean, it is something that F1 has been playing around with that idea of like rotating in a races. I, I would like to see it. I mean, it, it mixes up the calendar for sure. I remember back in the day, like when uh, I think it was when Bernie Ecclestone and the crew there were, were making up the calendar. And I think like, if I remember correctly, a lot of the times the way that they were plotting out uh, the geography of how they went to which races was the rainy seasons. Like, were they going mm. to, you know, were they going to a place when it was during their rainy season so they could avoid having to deal with racing in the wet and all that kind of stuff. And now, like when you look at it, it kind of is, it ha- they, they haven't really avoided something like that. I mean, I remember, no. like like you said, like Imola last year getting rained out, obviously with the horrible floods that were going on there and, and all that, and, like, and then having to cancel the race and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you kind of have to look at geography that way a bit, but at the same time, I mean, I think it makes more sense to do your calendar based on like trajectory, like, where are you going? Like, I think Mm -hmm. starting off this year, even though it's, it's kind of, um, it's been a little bit tough for the viewer because in, in Canada and United States and the East coast, West coast is because obviously you're now watching the race at like, I mean, this weekend's going to be what, like two and three in the morning Mm -hmm. to watch the, the race. I mean, you're you're doing that all up front so you're doing that with australia you're doing that with japan you're doing that with china to start off the year next year but at the same time 
in terms of freighting, in terms of like logistics, getting everybody to these places, it, it does make more sense. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I always felt like too, maybe, you know, when, if you're trying to avoid rainy seasons, you can use the, um, the Middle Eastern tracks as a great stopgap, right? You know, if you're, if you're, if you're saying that this part of Europe is going to be in its rainy season, well, you know where it's not. And, yeah. uh, you know, I know Abu Dhabi has got to be the last, like Yas Marina has got to be the last one. I get it, but it just feels like let's, uh, I, I think there's got to be a balance between regionality and of course not getting rained out because nobody wants to see a race rained out when you've waited two weeks and get all excited. And basically all the cars are flown in anyway. So it's a waste of money. Now, one of the things that, that we're going to see in our first Grand Prix since 2019, we'll do a little bit more of a preview on Thursday is the first race sprint, sorry, sprint race of the season. Um, there have been a lot of changes to this format since it was introduced uh, three, four years ago, Tim. And last year, to me, seemed like the most disjointed version of it because it was mm -hmm. like, well, you're going to race and then you're going to qualify and, and you know, does this count or whatever. So what do we know that they've reached? They've rejigged the rules again. What are the sprint race rules now? Yeah, just so you can get that park for May, right? I mean, if yeah. you go back to uh, the Austin, the USGP last year, and then obviously we had uh, Lewis Hamilton getting busted with the, the plank where uh, that was actually a really great race yeah. from, yeah. from him and Mercedes. So it's a shame <laughs> like, like, that actually happened. <laughs> it was. It was they, great. They had, brought a, they had brought a new floor to the car, and seeing as how they only had – uh, one practice session they never really could get a uh, uh they couldn't they couldn't get like a good barometer of where like the floor was in relation to the ground so the ride height of the car they weren't able to get that dialed in just right mm -hmm. so they were getting great performance but they weren't getting all the plank wear and they ended up getting all of the plank wear <laughs> they got disqualified yes um so a big part of that with this is essentially uh, making sure that that park for May um, uh, rule doesn't really come in until after you qualify for uh, the Grand Prix, which is going to be held on Saturday. So your Saturday qualifying for the Grand Prix uh, like normal, uh, but you're also getting that sprint race in as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so that feels a little bit less disjointed. Uh, I would say so. I mean, like, I think a big part of it, like Adam, is is trying to make sure that um, teams are able to kind of get that, like, optimization in, mm -hmm. like, making sure that you're optimizing uh, the package that you have without, you know, yeah, I think a big part of it is the sprint, the sprint races. I mean, however you feel about them, I'm not a huge sprint race guy. Uh, I don't get overly excited with them because they haven't been great i mean if you were to reverse the grids you know i could be persuaded to have an interest in them a little bit more but like i obviously cover them for sure but i just don't really care for them much right like right. it's right it doesn't uh it's not like the grand prix right you're working a you're working a weekend with this it's kind of like you're getting one practice and then okay it's you know, time to qualify for your sprint race and do your sprint race and all that other good stuff. And I think you, you miss that window of really trying to figure out where the car is and that can take away from your Grand Prix. So think about if you're battling for a championship and then all of a sudden you come to a weekend, it throws a huge wrench into everything. And now you're not really battling for a championship because of this sprint race. Yeah. And so yeah. you put that, all that work in. And so, I mean, it was something similar to, what was it? 2021 Brazil. I remember, you know, remember Lewis was was gaining on Max in that championship, and then we had the sprint in Brazil, and he took a penalty for something and was at the back. And if he didn't have a good sprint race, who's to say he would have done well in, you know, anything after that? Agreed. Right, yep. that could have been, yep. you know, pretty brutal for him. So, well, uh, Max Verstappen uh, said that, uh, and I quote directly: "I think it's not great to do." Uh, meaning uh, having the sprint race in China, uh, because when you've been away from a track for quite a while, I think that you never know what you're going to experience. So uh, it would have been better to, to have a normal race weekend there. On the other hand, it's probably spices things up a bit more. Uh, and, and maybe what uh, 
they, meaning Formula One and the fans, would like to see. But purely from a driving and performance perspective of the sport, it's not the smartest thing to do. It was the last set of regulations the last time we raced at this course. So we don't have any idea. And uh, Andrea Stella said that that this weekend for McLaren specifically is going to be a weekend of damage control, specifically citing, Tim, uh, the fact that uh, he said you have so many low-speed hairpins even uh, in corner two, corner three, you spend a long time in the corners. He said China might be a bit of damage limitation for us. And then from Miami onwards, hopefully uh, we kind of set a better stage. So what does he mean by that in relation to the McLaren car? Why are yeah. they at a disadvantage? Uh, their car is just not great in slow speed corners, right? And especially corners that are long in duration. So mm -hmm. the, the longer the trajectory of the corner, the more time you spend in the corner, especially if it's slow speed, their car just isn't really strong in those uh, circumstances where like, if you look at the Red Bull and, you know, I've been saying this since, you know, Bahrain preseason testing, it's, they're really strong in the slow speed stuff. Like they're very strong. Yeah. Uh, they're strong everywhere, obviously, but but part of their strength is is really within the slow speed stuff coming out of the corner where McLaren suffers a lot. They're great in the high speed stuff like everybody saw in uh, the first sector in Jeddah. And mm -hmm. then again in Japan, really strong there as, as well. Uh, but again, I mean, that's something for them. And Stella had said this, it's going to take them a year to dial that out of the car because essentially, you know, as you start to make gains with, your current car, you know, you, it, it's a, it's a bit of a balance where it's kind of like, okay, well, we got to give up something to get something. And it's really hard to keep your advantage and then improve on your weakness as well. It takes a long time to sort through all of that where it's, it's kind of like with McLaren, it, it's, it's almost like they've doubled down on their strengths, which I think in, respect to what they do, I would have done the same thing for sure, right? There's going to be races where they're going to be really strong, but then there's going to be races where they're going to suffer. And it's something in the off season they didn't really address, right? They didn't right. really, really tackle and addressed, address that issue of slower speed corners. It's something that's plagued them for a while now. Um, but I mean, you know, you take a look at a team like Ferrari, strong kind of all around, good, good mm -hmm. all around car. Mm -hmm. Um and then as for Max's comments, you know, I tend to agree with him. And a big part of why saying that is you're, you're not getting the amount of time you need to optimize the car to get the best performance out of it. So you could see a Grand Prix this weekend and it could be great, right? Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. Like we could have um, a great main race on Sunday simply because of the sprint race that we had and the lack of time teams have had to really um, grab the performance out of the car. So who knows? Maybe Red Bull could actually struggle in a situation like this. Maybe. I mean, obviously, they're difficult know, to a, see, but yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a big ask. Right. But like at the end of the day, I mean, you could see a really great race on, on Sunday because of not having those practice sessions to really iron out the details with the car. Well, and uh, uh, I think it's going to be a, a fascinating race for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of drivers on this on this um, on this grid that have never raced a Formula One car around this track. Like, yeah, it's, it's probably awesome. half, right? right? Yeah, it's so really it's it's significant. And and I, I'm I'm estimating there. I'm sure there'll be somebody in the YouTube comment section who's got the actual number and gets You're upset that get I don't blasted, have it. Get blasted, buddy. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't care. <laughs> I get blasted on every show. That's the whole point of YouTube. You're going to get blasted. Um, my point is. I think, you know, like looking at I'm, – I'm curious to see if it's veteran presence that wins out or if it's young guys who don't have anything to lose that win out. Like I look at a guy like Valtteri Botas, and I know that they've got to get their pit stops under three seconds still, and they still haven't been able to do that. There's a guy that has raced really well at this track before when he was in a Mercedes, and does his experience against his teammate, uh, who is a Chinese driver, um, does that win out? Or is it is it going to be a guy like who surprises us? Is it like going to be like an Oscar Piastri um, or a, I mean, Logan Sargent? You don't know, right? And, and that's what's going to kind of be fun. Like Daniel and Yuki. I don't think Yuki was in an F1 car the last time they were in, in China. So uh, is Daniel finally going to out-qualify Yuki? That's a, those are some interesting stories that are kind of developing. Yeah, actually, that's a great point, Adam. I mean, if we go through some of like, and this is just going off the top of my head. I mean, Sargent uh hasn't 
race there um in f1 obviously same with piastri uh same too can be said about yuki mm-hmm. um uh, Joe hasn't raced there in an F1 car. I think that was Lando's rookie season. Yeah, 2019. Like it wasn't... Same with George. That was yeah. his rookie season as well. His teammate Robert Kubica at the mo- at at that time at Williams. Um, and so yeah, so there's going to be some drivers here who haven't driven at the track, and so it's whether or not they've they've done enough on the simulator. You know, back at factory, back at home base. Um, to get up to speed. But the other, the other thing with all this is like, there's, there's new track surface there. Like this is mm-hmm. all, so there's not a lot of data that's been collected and that's kind of, you know, going back to what Max was, was talking about. So there's not a lot of, also a lot of data that's been collected, if at all, any, mm-hmm. um, from the track surface that's been laid down since the last time they were there. So they don't really know in terms of tires, what's the tire going to do, in relation to what the car is doing in relation to what the surface is giving them. And so that's another thing that throws a big wrench into everybody's plans at the same time is the lack of, of data that they have from compared to the last time that they were there. So, you know, that's also going to be actually an important uh, topic and storyline as we get closer to, to the, to the race itself. When you're a rookie and you go to a track that you don't really know, you know, you're going to struggle right? It's mm-hmm. not going to be something that's easy to do. And, and folks would be like, well, well, they're F1 drivers. Like, uh, it all should be, well, that's not the way it is because mm-hmm. let me tell you something, you're going to go somewhere you've never been. It has different characteristics. There are different components to a track that allow you to do different things with a race car. And I got news for you. Sometimes a little tiny bump somewhere that you've discovered five years ago, that's still there that can help you get the car into the corner without having to turn the wheel and scrub speed. So there's a little bit of knowledge for you. So, I mean, every time you're new to a track, you're always taking in information. You're always learning new things. And with the more experienced drivers, I mean, like the Lewis, like Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso, I mean, these guys have done tons of laps there. So they really understand the characteristics of the track. The new surface may, you know, throw them for a bit of a loop, but I mean, they have so much so much experience on the track; they're going to be able to get around that, no problem. But it's just yeah. the, the the new guys that are coming to this track; it it uh, could be a, it could be difficult for them to start off with. And the wrinkle and the thing that makes it fun is it's the first time on these regulations that kicked in a couple of years ago. So while yeah. everybody's aware of the regulations and the changes it made to the cars, even the experienced guys have no idea how they're totally going to react going around this track. Although I'm sure they yeah. can figure it out. So yeah, it, yeah, it, it yeah. will. It's going to be a fun racing for if you're a racing nerd and you're looking for stuff like that. And by the way, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a racing nerd. Um, this is uh, <laughs> this is the type of stuff that you look for. It's exciting. This is the 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 tenth of a tenth that gets you into first place over somebody else. Now, um, Tim, there's a couple things we want to mention, and I'll, I'm going to save some of our prep for later on because uh, we're going to run super long if I go into everything that I had prepped for today's show. But Aston Martin, uh, really important detail here. Uh, the Aston Martin brand will be with the Formula One team until at least 2030. This is an enormous win for Formula One, and I think uh, probably an even bigger win for Aston Martin. Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, you know, Lawrence and the consortium that he led to – to buy up. I think when, when Lawrence first got involved in Aston Martin Lagonda, which is the auto manufacturer, which is the car company itself. I mean, mm-hmm. they, I think he had put up over a hundred, well, not just him, but ever, but everybody who was involved was over 180 million. And I believe that got him like just over 16%. And then they doubled down on that. And now they have about 20, I want to say about a 25% ownership within the group Mm -hmm. i i mean obviously when you have um a board and you have to convince them to you know put money somewhere or back something or whatever it is you have to get everybody on board right like it's it's not just one person saying this is what we're doing yeah (laughs) yeah it's not how it works uh you have to get everyone on the same boat and row in the same direction or else just forget about it. So for them to get to reinvest in in F1 and their deal was due to run out in 2026, I think a big part of having Fernando Alonso 
um, sign on for for a longer term. That was important for Aston Martin to say this makes sense. Uh, we've done well with being a part of Formula One. We've seen that our um, purchasers are younger. So they've really... They've... I've got some numbers on that if you're interested. Oh, yeah. 100% yeah. hit me with it. So I dove deep. Obviously, last year they had a bit of a, a press conference about this. So there's a few articles written. But, um, uh, you know, the headline, and this is just from Yahoo, is is Aston Martin may have earned as much as $80 million in sales due to their cars just being the safety car in Formula One. Stroll said, there's an expression, I didn't believe it, but we're actually experience it, experiencing it. Race on Sunday, sell on Monday. Um, just the impact of the Aston Martin supplying the Formula One car, excuse me, at, the impact of Aston Martin supplying the Formula One car, um, has they believe has led to uh, 300 to 400 units of the Vantage F1 edition cars. And the reason that they're Vantage F1 is because there's eight different types of green that you can get when you buy an Aston Martin. The Formula One green is the one that people purchase en masse. That's huh. the one that you that they upsell you on. Um, and uh, and this is from the New York Times. And this, again, this is from last year, but it's ar around this time last year, April, May. Uh, and I'll, I'll read direct. Aston Martin ex executives point to a January brand health study that showed a whopping 96% of US customers feel the association with Formula One makes them more likely to consider the brand. 98% of Aston Martin owners feel Formula One's halo makes the cars, quote, more exciting to drive and, quote, improves the brand technology credentials. Uh, Aston Martin has generated, they said, perhaps $60 million in sales in this particular article. And by the way, those cars, American at the time, cost $178,000. Um, and Stroll said, you know, that the... The, and we'll get to the performance of them. He said, I've, I, he's an avid car collector. He said, I always felt with Aston Martin that the beauty of the brand never matched the performance, meaning that, sorry, that they were more beautiful than they were performing. And yeah, I think that the, they've gone a long way to try to change that. Um, and I, I'm going to keep going with the stats because I think they're interesting. 24% yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, yeah. of new car buyers choosing one of the company's nine shades of green. So you didn't see a lot of green cars on the road mm. before. You just mm -hmm. don't. You'll see a lot of silver, champagne, black, white, um, just generally. And like, I think brands like Lexus won't sell them to you in any other color. Aston mm. Martin, like I said, has nine shades of green. I got that wrong. And 24% are, are choosing that. Uh, after the first podium last year, remember where Fernando yep. finished uh, third, I believe, and then yep. um, Lance was eighth. Um, there was a 29% increase in website traffic the next day. 72% of buyers uh you know get the racing inspired vantage f1 edition model launched in 2021 and market research indicates 88 percent of luxury cars car buyers are interested in formula one so obviously um if you're trying to connect with a high-end audience like you know it's the reason why you see rolex on there that's yeah. why you see these big brands there's an yep. enormous brand association and and Tim, I think the other thing that's really interesting is in 2022, Aston Martin issued a statement that said targeting 2030, that would be the end of the line for internal combustion engines. And this is the other big story from the weekend. Um, they are now going to reverse that. Uh, 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 Lawrence Stroll said, as, for as long as we're allowed to make ICE cars, in, internal convention, uh, com combustion engine cars, we will make them. I think uh, there will always be a demand, even if it's small. So they're going to make them well into the 2030s. My question to you is, a lot of technology that goes into real cars, like road cars, mm -hmm. is developed in Formula One. Hybrid technology mm -hmm. is, has, was pushed along significantly by Formula One, uh, cars that we mm -hmm. see with hybrid engines now. Is it possible... Uh, because we know that there is not ele enough electricity in the world to power the world's cars if everybody went battery tomorrow. Is it possible that Formula One, you know, with its net zero uh, commitment, finds new types of fuels that yeah. can potentially be, you know, it, it doesn't mean it's not oil based. I don't know. I don't know enough about the science. Mm -hmm. But is it possible that the internal combust combustion engine continues with green fuel? Uh, yet, I mean, that's the goal, right, is to run with sustainable fuels in 2026 and beyond in Formula One. And you have a lot of uh, different 
gas companies, we'll call them working on petroleum, working on um, that initiative, trying to come up with different forms of, is it a biofuel? Um, I mean, there are other forms that you can derive a bit of, you know, you can turn some of this into liquid and then obviously power your vehicle. There are, I mean, there's a company out in uh, Squamish, BC called, uh, what, I call, what is it? Carbon Engineering. Mm-hmm. And essentially, they pull CO2 out of the out of the air and they basically mix all of that with H2O. And essentially, it's a fascinating thing. And I don't want to bore everybody with this, but essentially, they're able to to pull the CO2 out of, out of the air and turn that into fuel and have it as what it's called, like a drop and go. Mm-hmm. So you can just pull up the gas station, your... Your ICE wouldn't need any um, different modifications to it to to run with this. So you uh, could run a run fuel. a current road car on this fuel. Fuel. Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, there there's another. They use it for. I believe it's called capping. And essentially, they put they're pulling CO two out and they're capping like oil wells with it. They're turning it into the liquid liquid form and and filling, you know, uh, oil holes out. Of, so where are we pull oil from the earth or filling that with a lot of this CO2 that we're pulling from the air and putting it down in. Um, I think it's called like requestering. I can't even, I'm going to screw this whole thing up. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> that's all right. Um, but essentially like it, it's, that's another sort of, or sort of form. And, and I think, you know, that is the goal. Like that's the goal for F1 is to try and get to that net zero by, you know, 2030, but to make sure that you're there, they're running, um, sustainable fuels by 2026 and so mm-hmm. like i i just i wonder how much like if 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 f1 and everyone that they're working with on the project is able to pull it off like i, I just i i'm curious to see how that would change our market yeah like how is that going to change like the road cars like wh- what does that do in terms of like because like you know government you know gets in gets involved at some point um with the electric vehicle stuff and I don't know. It's like you said. Is is there is the infrastructure big enough? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like is it, well, and and then can the sustain other thing. All that? The the other thing is that that stroll and like when you were talking high end sports cars, I don't think the average driver cares too too much about this. But as a race fan, you grew up with grunting, snoring, screaming <laughs> engines, yeah. right? Yeah, like yeah, you yeah. really did. And and so <laughs> when the Aston Martin people did a, a test, a control test on on their potential buyers. All of them said they liked the smells and the sounds of race cars. And so that's why they're part of the reason why they want to continue with it is because if you're buying one, you want to have that experience. And like I, I've driven a McLaren Ar- uh, Artura and they're very cool, right? Because you can switch. They're the, they're the EV McLarens. You can switch back and forth between the internal combustion engine and the battery. So when you're mm-hmm. in city, you don't need you don't need mm-hmm. to be screaming around. And it is absolutely silent you can't mm-hmm. hear or you can hear everything you can if you're driving by and there's a, 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 a people 10 feet away having a conversation on the sidewalk you'd be able to hear every word tim it's crazy yeah. but Plug you get out on the highway yeah. you flip it into gas gear and it just it's first off they're rocket ships but they sound great still and yeah. i asked the guy who was who you know the, the rep about it and i said so who's your target audience here and he said we are looking for younger younger adults that have come into money or have money, family money, whatever, that are very interested in not just the sounds and the smells, but also in the future. What's the Mm -hmm. technology of the future? You know, Mm -hmm. I want to have the leaning edge tech in my car. Mm -hmm. So there may be something that Aston Martin does there. Their next or their first EV was due next year. It's not going to come out until 2027. I sat down... And I want to say it was 20, I think it was 2019. I sat down and um, did a one-on-one interview with Ross Braun about Mm -hmm. a lot of this. And he, he had said to me that it's, it's difficult to replace every single ICE that's out on the road. Now he said, that's close to impossible to take, you know, everyone's internal combustion engine car, like away from them, trucks, um, tractors, boats, planes, like it's, you can't just take all this stuff uh, away. He's like, there has to be another form of energy that can come in and keep 
these things alive, keep them going, but in a sustainable fashion. Mm -hmm. And that's when we got talking about sustainable fuels and where is all that going and F1. And they started telling me about like, well, Hey, like, you know, we're working on some of that stuff. And he still sees that like the electric vehicle serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. He, he thinks that uh, at the time he thought that there would be more than sort of one form that would take us into the future. Like it could be electric, could be just straight ICE, it could be the plug-in hybrids, hybrids. Um, AI, I tend to agree with them now. Like now that I start to see the the landscape of things and where we're at just like right now, mm -hmm. I mean, the hybrids make a ton of sense. Like they're great. Sure. And, it's, and it's really the technology itself has come like a long way too. Like it's, it is very smart tech. And then also hydrogen, like where does that sort of fit fit in with everything as well? Because now we're starting to get hydrogen in, involved in in motorsports. So I mean, it's it's definitely fascinating to see like where all that is definitely going. Like everything needs to serve a purpose, obviously. Um, but yeah, no, it was interesting to read uh, those comments in the Sunday Times, like from that from that article. And then also like he went on, like Lawrence went on to talk to like Roden, Roden track. I think it was, he did a, did an interview there. It's a great article actually uh, as well. You should check that out. Um, and I think, you know, big thing for them is pulling back on the electric vehicle component and going more into that uh, plug-in hybrid sort of direction where you can still have your performance, but you also have the battery component to it at the same time. Um, yeah, it's just, it's really fascinating technology. I mean, even back when F1 came in with the the hybrid power units and introduced them into Formula One, I mean, the technology that was in those things, Adam, is still to this day, like we're going back to 2014, still to this day, like, oh, it's absolutely Next level. incredible stuff, man. Incredible yeah. stuff. Yeah. But like, just to, to to carry off from that thought and to kind of get back into our Aston Martin conversation and getting back involved with the F1 team and obviously that being a great thing for for them. We I think as a car brand itself, you have to we have to understand like where Aston Martin like used to be. Like this was a company that was literally struggling struggling to stay alive for not just a few years. Like we're talking like a few decades, right? Yeah, Aston Martin and losing money were almost ubiquitous. Man, right? they went hand in hand. Like, and then there were so many different owners of the company over so many. Like Ford at one point owned them. Yep. Yeah. Right. For Just like, like they own Jag, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they. So it, it's. I mean, I think once they, once they got involved and made the F one push. Like, I think that is what's going to really help this company thrive in the future. And I think for myself, like, not to get selfish about this, but like when I was a kid, Adam, like the DB7. So when the Aston Martin DB7 came out and I saw that car, like in a, in a pamphlet, <laughs> I was like that, that the DB7 to me and still to this day. And then obviously because I was a kid and I held on to that, my dream car. Still is. And really? so like I fell in love with Aston Martins. And like I always thought, is this company going to survive? Like when I got older and understood and understood like the car market and got involved in it and worked with OEMs and stuff like that. Yeah. And started to understand the market and being like, Oh man, I I don't think Aston Martin's ever gonna survive and I don't think I'll ever get to drive one. <laughs> so, <laughs> well so, like, I remember I remember the vantage from the the James Bond when when oh, Daniel yeah. Craig took over. That was my I was like, Oh my god, that's the most beautiful car I've ever seen. Now you can get them yeah. pretty well priced, actually. I um, used to tell my dad, Adam, like I used to tell my dad, like, look, yeah, I, I would I would put this proposal to him. I'd sit down, I was like, I don't know, whatever, nine years old, ten years old. I'd just be like, Look, I'm like, you sell the house. We buy a trailer uh -huh. and we get an Aston Martin DB7 and we just move into that. <laughs> how did that, uh, how'd that proposal go? Oh, yeah, for yeah. You? He, he laughed at me and walked away. So. I'm sure. <laughs> well, Tim, listen, we got plenty to cover on Thursday. And, you know, the great thing about the Thursday of a race weekend is we've had media day the day before and uh, yes, watch the drivers take some snipes at each other. Get excited for the Chinese Grand Prix. So enjoy. Follow Tim Haraney on Twitter at Tim Haraney uh, or me at Adam Wilde. And you can follow at SDPN Sports as well. Tim, thanks so much. Adam, thanks again, man. Appreciate it.